But hey, we're in the middle of a series, and um, this is a strategic series that I really felt like the Lord would have us share on in the season that we find ourselves in as a nation. It's called New Testament Wisdom. I just feel like we need some wisdom to navigate the day and the hour that we live in. And I knew as soon as kind of the Lord spoke that to me, I knew exactly the book that we would use to study from. It's the book of James. And the reason we want to use the book of James is James is considered, a lot of theologians would call it the New Testament book of wisdom. Its sister book is in the Old Testament. It's the book of Proverbs. But it's just one of those books. Even though it only takes you 11 minutes to read, it's five chapters. It's just one of those books that I don't like reading that book. I don't like reading the book of James. I read the book of James and I go, well, there's too many things in there that I need to change about my life. There's too many things in there that I don't want to address about my life. I like talking the way I talk to people when they aggravate me. I like, you know, I like being jealous of other people. I want what they have. And, and I like it, you know, when I do things my own way and not God's way. And you read this book here and it's just one of those books that you, you just want to, you want to avoid it. Like, I like what it's saying. I just don't like doing what it asked me to do. And that's the book of James for me. It's like Dave Ramsey. You know, if those that don't know who he is, he's a financial peace university guy. And he's the guy who talks about budgets and getting your finances in order. And, and I, love what he, I love what he says because I know what it does, but I hate doing it. He, he recently put out something. You want to know how you waste $5,000 a year? He goes, spend $13 a day on coffee and fast food. And that just ruined my day when I heard that. I mean, I don't drink, I don't cuss, I don't chew, I don't run with those who do, but I do like my Starbucks. Like, give me some, but he's, he just ruined that for me. And what James is doing here, James is a book that we're not gonna like to read. It's a book that sounds good, but it's gonna challenge you. It's full of nuggets. It's not a lot of theology. It's a lot of, it's a lot of practical stuff. And here's what James is saying. He's saying, hey, you believe in something. You believe in Jesus. You believe he's your Lord. You believe he's your savior. He said that has to go beyond just believing. Your beliefs have to turn into actions. And he's gonna challenge you on it. And as I said last week, he's not gonna let you get by with just waving your hand in church and praying a prayer. He said, hey, your faith should show up in your life and actually it's your turn into a new way of living. In other words, people should see that there's, your faith is an action. In fact, if James, I think James, if he were to ask you when you read this book, he said, if you're gonna read my letter, if you're gonna read my book, I think James would say, I would want you to pray this prayer when you open this book. And it would be just simple, Lord, show me some things. And see, a lot of us, when we read our Bible, we go, Lord, show me, reveal yourself, and I wanna need some information. But James takes this prayer a little bit further. He says, show me some things that I need to see about myself. Show me some things that are about my life that are gonna cause me to grow that I'm not gonna be able to hide behind church membership. I'm not gonna be able to hide behind the, the title, being a Christian, a Christ follower. He said, no, I want this to show up in your life. Thus, it makes it kind of hard to read a little bit. You know, one of my favorite speakers, you, you'll laugh when you hear this, is a, is a lady by the name of Joyce Meyer. And uh, the reason I like Joyce Meyer is because she just says it like it is. And she tells you like it is. And what really got me watching her one day was when one of our kids years ago, 50, probably 20 plus years ago, when she was first becoming well-known, you had her speaking and, and, and one of our kids said, Daddy, she said, that's a lady up there, but it sounds like a man because she's got this deep voice. And I said, well, I got to hear this. And I started watching her and listening to her. And she'd say stuff like this. And it's ruined my life, some of the stuff she said. She said, hey, if you're... If you go out to the grocery store and you take a grocery cart, and if you're too lazy to put it back into the cart bin, then you're never gonna be a leader in the Christian life. <laughs> 20 years ago, I've heard that. So for 20 years, every time I'm tempted to leave my cart there, I gotta walk it back. <laughs> and every time I'm just kind of th thinking bad thoughts about Joyce Meyer. And, and the reality, that's the book of James for you. It's just gonna hit you, but... We, he said, you'll like the end results. You might not like the process, but you'll like the end results. 
See, a lot of us are focused. See, there's a lot of things that are little things that are robbing joy from your life, that are robbing peace from your life, that are robbing security and good mental health. A lot of these little things, they're adding up and you think they're not big, a big deal. How I treat other people and showing favoritism and getting my wisdom from the world. And we're gonna talk about relationship stuff. And he, James just goes through it and says, these little things are really causing you a lot of problems. And you just don't know it. In fact, there's a verse in the Old Testament from another what we call a book of wisdom. It's Song of Solomon. There's a famous verse in there and it just says, catch for us the foxes. And then it qualifies. The little foxes, not the big ones, the little ones that ruin the vineyards are vineyards that are in full bloom, are in bloom. And what, that's an that's a agricultural society culture back then. And so when you read this, you go, what does that even mean? And really what the author is saying here is, see, back then they had these, the big foxes, they would come and they'd take some fruit off the vine. And that would just, they would lose some things, but these little foxes could never reach that. So they would chew the roots out. And instead of taking a little bit of fruit, it would ruin all the vineyard. And so that's what he said, it's the little things that are causing you big problems in your life. It's not the small things. It's not the big things, rather, it's the small things. We know the big things that cause us murder and, and, and adultery and thieving and stealing. So we know all that. But it's sometimes it's the little things that James gets in there and says, hey, I want to challenge you in some things. And today we're gonna go to a, a chapter, chapter four and verse one of the book of James. And this is gonna be our theme verse today, for today. He said, what causes fights and quarrels among you? And I know, you can raise your hand and go, I know the answer to that. I know what causes fights among me. People who vote different than me. I know what's causing fights among me. You should see my boss. You should see who I married. Worse yet, you should see her, his mom. Her mom. My mother-in-law. You get all of these, you know, it's my friends. It's people on social media and Twitter. He says, I know You say, I know what's causing the fights among me. And here's my thesis for today. And may I suggest that your relationships are more spiritual than you think they are. They impact your walk with God more than you think they do. You go, well, no, no, no. How I interact with other people doesn't affect how I do things horizontally don't affect me vertically. I mean, me and God, but that's not what the Bible says. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, it said, In the first place, Paul said, I hear when you come together as a church. So here we are. He said, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. He said, there's divisions among you. And honestly, he goes, I kind of believe it. And Paul is like, this is confusing him. He's a little bit aggravated by it. And you go, well, that's, that's just people for you. It doesn't affect me and God, but that's not what Paul said. A few verses later, about 10 verses later, he said, because of this, a man ought to examine himself. A woman ought to examine himself before he eats communion of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord. Let me just tell you, the body of the Lord is made up of all bunch of people that are in this room today. There are young people here. There are older people here. There are married people here. There are divorced people here. There are white people here. There are black people here. There are Hispanic people here. There are Asian people here. There are uneducated people and educated people. And guess what? We make up the body of Christ. That's why I love our church. I love our church because we're not a white church. We're not a black church. We're not a Spanish church. We're not an Asian church. We're just the church. We have one thing in common. Jesus is our Lord. Right? And he said, hey, you got to recognize the body of the Lord. And there's divisions. He said, if you don't, you're not going to like it. It's going to bring judgment upon you. It's going to, some things aren't working in your life. And you think, what's, what's up with you and me, Lord? And the Lord goes, hey, nothing's up with you and me, but we got some issues with the people in your life. And I, let me remind you, also who's in the body of Christ is your spouse, your children, your parents, the people closest to you. There's a saying in our home we use often, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. And that you're just stuck with them forever. 
You know, years ago, Dean and me made a decision, hey, we're not gonna get divorced, so we might as well figure this out. We might as well like each other. You know, and that's, it's, it's, you say, well, this is not a big deal. Well, Jesus said it was. He said, I tell you, Matthew 18, I also tell you this, if two of you could get an agreement, if I could, if I could work against division in a home, division in a church, division in a nation, he said, I could here on this earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. Here's what he said, agreement, unity is a bigger deal than you think it is. It's a big deal. Like God said, I can do some big things in some pretty average people's life if I could get them to walk in unity. Now you know why the enemy works overtime to bring division in a relationship, in a home, and even in a nation, and even in churches. Jesus said it this, Matthew 12, six chapters earlier, he said, he knew their thoughts and he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. In every city or household divided against itself will not stand. He just said, right from the words of Jesus, he said, hey, you're not gonna make it. I need you to know something. The devil hates unity. Because you know what it does? It reminds him of what his life was like in heaven. He had unity with God. And then he came up, rose up against God. And in that moment, he was thrown out of, out of heaven. And it just reminds him of what he once had. So he hates it. Today I wanna to talk about in 26 minutes. Unity versus division. Because I will tell you this, a divided nation needs a united church. A divided community needs united families. Children that are, in, parents hear me, children that are in the world that are being pulled every direction, they need a home where there's, there's unity in there. And the enemy, I'm watching it, I'm watching it in real time, the enemy's working very, very hard to bring division in people's lives. Unity does not mean uniformity. Unity does not mean you agree with everything everyone says, and in fact, it's quite the opposite. You know, you can have unity without being uniform. And it's the big things that we all think is causing problems, but sometimes even in our homes, it's the little things. You've heard of some great, great men and, that have led our nation and famous men like Abraham Lincoln. You've heard of Abraham Lincoln. He's the guy that was, he, he was credited for saving the union. You've heard of Thomas Edison. He's the guy that invented the light bulb and really figured out how to, you know, uh, cause electricity and, and how to ma uh, manage that and how to harness that and, 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 and deliver it safely to our homes. We know about Thomas Edison. These are guys, but see, I'm a pastor and I do funerals and I did one yesterday. And it was remarkable when I saw, and I, and I see this often in funerals. When I see them speaking, they're not talking about the big accomplishments of that person. They're talking about the little things. They're talking about the things that happen every day. They were committed, they were devoted, they were loved, they tell little stories. It's not the big accomplishments, that they had the best GPA in their class or they were millionaires or all of that, the inventions they had. They talk about the little things. See, we've heard of Abraham Lincoln. We've heard of Thomas Edison. But have you heard of a guy named Mordecai Ham? Some of you have, some of you haven't. Mordecai Ham, let me tell you about Mordecai Ham. He's just a little old evangelist that would preach in the old back countries, back country churches way, way back 100 years ago. He would do tent meetings, just little gatherings. One day he was doing a tent meeting in North Carolina and there was a little young man there who gave the altar call. He came forward and said, I want to live my life for Jesus. And that little old guy that walked up there was a man that you now know as Billy Graham. And Billy Graham has been known, has preached face to face to 210 million people in his lifetime. One time he preached in 1973, I think, in Korea, South Korea, to over one million people in one service. But there'd be no Billy Graham if there wasn't a Mordecai Ham. In other words, we're looking at always the big things and not the small things. And I know you think my relationships and how I interact with each other really doesn't impact me. That's not what James is saying. James is saying this, this impacts your relationship with the Lord more than you know. Unity in a home, unity in a relationship, unity in a friendship, unity in a church, unity in a nation. 
are vital. Here we go. We're going to go right back to our verse. James chapter 4 and verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? And we know, we, we want to say it's my boss. I know, how, I know how you feel. If I could just get my wife to straighten up, my husband, my kids to listen. He said, really? You think it's them? Don't they come from your desires? That battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and you covet, we're coming back to this word, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. He said, and by the way, you do not have because you do not ask God. You're trying to get from people what only God can give. And, and, and I'm just gonna take a quick moment and a couple of thoughts that came out of these verses. What causes division in relationships? What causes division really honestly in, in marriages and in homes and in friendships? There's really what I call relationship killers. The biggest one is this. He said, you covet. You know what does it? It's comparison. When we start comparing our lives to someone else's life. And this has always been from the beginning of time, honestly. But you know, with the advent of social media, it's impacting everybody. And so we see something on social media and they've even Got, got, got a new phrase called FOMO or fear of missing out and we see what they're doing and all of a sudden we covet that. We want that and we see, you know, and it, we, we see other people's marriages, other people's homes and, and, and finances and stuff and we want it and we start comparing ourselves and James says, you know what? Comparison, and the Bible tells you this as well all throughout it, never ever does anything good come from you comparing yourself to somebody else. Nothing good comes of it. In fact, I didn't put it in my notes, but if you were to go read the Gospel of John, the last chapter, chapter 21, I believe it is, the last four or five verses, it's amazing. He ends the whole Gospel with this thought. Peter and, and, and John and Jesus are having this conversation, and Jesus says to Peter, hey, I need to let you know you're going to use your life to make a difference, but you're one day you're going to have to give up your life for me. And you'd think Peter would say, well, Lord, I'd be honored to. He looks and he goes... You, this is right in your Bible. He looks right over there and goes, well, what about him, Lord? And I love Jesus' response. Jesus goes, none of your business about him. Just take care of yourself. Just take care of yourself. And James, James says it like this, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you'll find disorder in every evil practice. He said, hey, when you start comparing yourself to someone else, you're gonna have disorder in your home. You're gonna have disorder in your relationship. Because here's the deal. Everybody posts and puts out there and even presents an image in church today that everything in your life is okay. I can look through your social media page and I can tell you that you don't always look that good every day all the time. I know better than that because I see you in person sometimes. <laughs> but you're like our family. We get a picture, everybody's smiling. When the kids were little, they, what you don't see is the, the stern talk they got just before. You will smile and you will act like you like each other for this picture. This is going on our Christmas card for the year and I don't care. You, know, you could hate each other in an hour, but right now you're gonna love each other. That's what happens. God told Samuel, he's anointing David. He said, he said here's, here's a thought that you maybe th never thought of. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance. And that's a word for somebody. Quit looking at it, what everyone else has. Or his height. For I have rejected him. The Lord does not, here's what, here, here's what it is. The Lord does not look at the things God's not impressed with how many homes you own, how many cars you have, what kind of clothes you wear, what your bank account balance is. He said, those aren't, those, none of those things are wrong. In fact, God will bless you. But he said, that doesn't impress God. He doesn't look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. He said, hey, if you're gonna copy anybody, look at their heart. Well, you've got this. Comparison, that kills relationships. And then a few verses later, again, James, just such a sweet writer and author. 
you adulterers. Just so kind when he just goes after you. He says, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, he's just describing, if you want to have one foot in the world, that's where you're getting all of your influence from. He said, you're making yourself an enemy with God. He says, you're making it too hard to walk with God when you're getting all your influence from the world Monday through Saturday and you're giving God an hour and 20 minutes on a Sunday morning. He said, it's hurting you more than you know. Another relationship killer is this, is when we invest into the wrong relationships. We just invest into the wrong ones. And sometimes we, in a moment like this, sometimes we just gotta do an inventory and say, who are we giving our best to? Maybe there are some people in your life that you're giving your best to and the, and the Bible warns you about it. And here's a verse that I'm gonna read. And I was, when I was giving my notes to the office this week about this morning's message, I thought, well, I've used that verse. I went back and did a search and this is the third time I've used this same verse in messages this year. And so when you see a verse show up three times in one year, I think the Holy Spirit's trying to tell you something. And here it comes out of the book of Proverbs. Walk with the wise and you become wise. Associate with fools. I don't even need to preach that. Thank you. I mean, even sounded better than me. I like that. He just said, hey, your friend choices are impacting you more spiritually than you think they are. They're impacting your walk with the Lord, your walk with other people. He says, it's time, and I would suggest, maybe it's time to do an inventory and say, should I have that person influencing my life like they do? Should I be giving that much time? And this is why, like, Friday night, we're doing an event here for the men, and it's just a man night, and um, it's Friday night, and it's, it's going to be at 6.30, you can show up even a little bit later if you need to, and we're going to have catered food in, and we're bringing some of the best speakers of, uh, in the nation in, great music, there'll be moments, there's going to be some after party fun, giving away tickets to football games, and that kind of thing, and, and uh, but the reason I'm doing this, and so someone said, why would you do that, because I listen, I know how busy everybody is. I'm as busy as you are. I get it. I don't want to give up a Friday night. But here's the reason why we're asking all the men bring, and bring a friend and we're making this available to you for free. And, and I just need you to register for it. Here's the reason why. The reason I want to do this is this, because if you associate with wise people, you become wise. And if I could maybe pull you out of your environment for a moment, we could get you out of some trouble. And so I would do whatever it took to get there. I would just do it. I would just, excuse me, I would just walk with the wise. That's what I would do. Now, James doesn't leave you there and tell you all the things you're doing wrong. James is gonna give you some, some, some solutions. And I want to, in just a few minutes, I wanna give you five solutions to bring unity back into relationships. I wanna give you five biblical things that you could do that if you could start applying these into your life today, where there's division, there could be the beginning of unity where there is a lot of people just divided because a house divided cannot stand. A church divided cannot stand. I wanna give you some strategies right out of the book of James that I've applied these in my life. And I'm gonna let you know, you might not like the process, but you're gonna like the end result. You might not like giving up coffee, but you're gonna like having money in your bank account balance. You might not like Put your cart back, but you're going to like the influence that you have when you develop disciplines in your life. That's what James is going to say. Five things, 13 minutes, here we go. But he said all these things about you, your division, your heart, your enemies with God. He says, but, I love this, but he gives us even more grace to stand against such evil desires. In other words, God wants to work with you on this. There's a grace. If you'll start moving, God will grace you. Basically what this verse is saying is you might not feel like doing these things, but once you take one step of faith, 
then God's presence and his hand and his anointing will come upon your life. What would be almost impossible to do, he'll give you the desire to do it. As the scripture says, God opposes the proud. You wanna do it your own way? God's not in it. But he favors the humble, the one that says, I'll do it God's way. So, what's your takeaway? Humble yourselves before God. Because I want God working with me, not against me. He said, God resists, he said, uh, rather, uh, before God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come, one of the best pieces of advice is in the whole book of James. Come close to God and God will come close to you. This is a verse that you're gonna see in the next series as my, as my thesis. Because if you'll come close to God, God will come close to you. Number one, here we go. Surrender all your life to God. Surrender all. Now I know you say, well of course you'd say that. Here's what I want you to know. There's some areas of our life that we've surrendered. And I would say the majority of us in this room today, 99% of us have surrendered 99% of our life to God. But James is asking you to do something different. James is asking for that 1%. That 1% that you don't want to give. And I want to be very clear here. God doesn't hate prideful people. He hates what pride does to you. It keeps you away from God, hurts other people. Remember the old hymn, I surrender all. I surrender all to thee, my Savior. I surrender all. What wouldn't that be if we just had a little, if we just gave God that last 1% what it could do in your life. That's if you want unity. The second thing is this, is we have to believe the best about people. You go, well, that's easy. No, 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 I'm gonna take it a step further. Believe the best about people in your life. That's your spouse. That's your parents. That's your neighbor. That's that's your kids. That's your boss. That's your employees. Are you ready? Those are the people who are voting for a different person than you're voting for. I mean, we could do a prayer meeting about the election, but you wouldn't like it because I would stand up and say, first of all, before we pray for the election, I want you to pray for the people who are voting different than you. Because that's what the Bible says to do. We gotta believe the best about people in your life. Here's what James said. He said, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or a sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, he, he said, you're not keeping it, but you're sitting in judgment on it. And James is just really, really clear here. He said, hey, take responsibility for your words. Take responsibility for the area of your life that you're responsible for. But here's the deal. You don't have to be the sheriff of the whole world. Let me help you out with something. You don't have to have an opinion about everything. It's possible for someone to say something and you go, well, that doesn't impact me. I don't have to make my voice heard. Let me go a step further. It's possible to read something and not have to respond to it if you don't know the person. Because there's a verse in the Bible that says this. He who... He who meddles in Facebook will always lose. (laughs) No one's mind has ever changed, but you got more division. It's just the way, see, I love the Andy Griffith show. A lot of you don't even know who that is. But there's a character named Barney Fife. And I like Barney Fife. And he's, he just makes the show for me. But the thing about Barney Fife is this. He's always in trouble. It gives me hope for my life. <laughs> the thing about Barney Fife is this. He's always in trouble. You know why? He can't mind his own business. <laughs> if he just do his job, he's okay. And the, the, the thing is, the people in your life that irritate you the most, God loves. You see, when you're a parent and you have children, Your job is to develop them, disciple them, model a life that they should hopefully want to live, and it also requires discipline, 
it requires reward and all that kind of the stuff if you want to raise up good children, okay? And so, but if when you become a grandparent, and I'm not one yet, but I, my, my parents, when we had children, all of a sudden, they just kind of got rid of the thing about modeling and disciplining and discipling, and it was just love and generosity. And I would be like, I'd see them and the kids would do something wrong, and my mom and said, oh, that's not a big deal. What are you, what are you concerned about that? They'll be fine. I mean, a little lie, beat each other, it's okay. I'd say, mom, you would beat us for that when we were kids. Well, that's the grandparent. You see the difference. But then God takes it a step further. And in James chapter five, in verse seven, he talks about the second coming of the Lord and he said, be patient therefore to the church until the coming of the Lord. He said, behold, God waits And then he said this, for the precious fruit of the earth. The people that you don't like, God calls precious. The people that irritate you, God calls precious. The people who vote different than you, God calls precious. The people that hurt you, God calls precious. He takes it a step further. Third thing is this, we want to add value to people. If you want to bring unity where there's division, add value. How can I make your life better? James chapter 2 and verse 8 says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. He says, you're doing right. He's just quoting Jesus. But if you show favoritism, if you only are nice to people who can do things for you, if you're only nice to people who you, it benefits you. He said, now, nah, again, James, he doesn't mess around. He said, that's just wrong. That's sinning. And you're convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Just shoots it straight with us. And he just says, are you adding value to people? I guess the question that I would want to ask that you could answer, are people better because they're around you? What people say about you, I am better because I'm in their small group. I am better because they're my neighbor. I am better because I work with them. And it's basically the principle, and as I was putting this together, I, I don't have time now, but I would talk about sowing and reaping. And you go, well, all I have is weeds around me. Oh, I, I don't have fruit like you have. I don't have, my life isn't like yours and And the reality is I would just respond to that and say, who's gonna be the first person in your home to sow a good seed among weeds? Who's gonna add value to other people, whether they deserve it or not? Let me wrap it up with these last two thoughts. I think you'd know this. Ask God to get involved. Just ask God. Say, God, I need you to get involved. God, I need you to get involved in our nation. God, I need you to get involved in our church. God, I need you to get involved in my marriage. In his discipline that I can give you, probably one of the greatest marriage disciplines I have in my life, in the highs and the lows and the ups and downs, because Dina and I have a far from perfect life. But we're devoted, we're committed, and we are living the best years of our life today. But for 30 years, for 30 years, there's hardly ever a day that goes by that I don't at least talk to God about my wife. When I first got married, I talked to God about her. And now I spend most of my time thanking God for her. And just just letting you know. You say, well, I don't like that. I know, I don't like the process either, but I like being married 30 years to the same person. I like going to bed. I like waking up to a beautiful woman, the same one. Ask God to get involved. Yeah, you don't know my kids. Ask God to get involved. James just said it like this. He said, now, I have a word for you. He said, I'm gonna shoot straight with you. Who brashly announced, today at the latest, tomorrow, we're off to such and such a city for a year. He said, we're gonna start a business. We're gonna make a lot of money. He says, you don't know the first thing about tomorrow. 
You're nothing but a wisp of fog catching a brief bit of sun before disappearing. Instead, make it a habit. He said, quit saying, I know everything. He said, here's the habit that I want you to make. Say, if the master, if God wills it, then and we're still alive, we'll do this or we'll do that. Here's what he said. Make it a habit to get God involved in all your decisions. That's just all he said. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26. He said he, he's getting ready to go to the cross. And he's there and he's, remember he said to the disciples, hey, I'm gonna go pray. Can a couple of you come with me? And remember they kept falling asleep. And he said, man, you couldn't, you couldn't hang with me this long? Well, they are gone. They're sleeping. He finally let them sleep. He said he went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground praying, my father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. No. Theologians would say he wasn't praying, I don't want to go to the cross. He wasn't praying that prayer. Here's the prayer he was praying. You have to know some of the Old Testament to know this. He's praying this prayer here. Lord, I know the price of sin. I don't want to be separated from you. So you have to understand, the, the cross was nothing. Men, I've, I, I've been to the Philippines. I've been to Guatemala. There are people that would go hang on a cross trying to be like Jesus. You can endure that. But this cup of suffering is something different. The cup of suffering means this. Every sin that's ever been committed by anybody was going to be poured on Jesus' life. That means this. In a moment, he was going to be a murderer. In a moment, he was going to be an abuser. He hadn't had that before in his life. In a moment, he was going to be a thief, a liar. And that's what he said. I don't want that. And you think about how hard that would be. Like you think about the most awful thing you can think about. Pedophilia. That's what he was going to become. Yet, the worst day of his life I don't know what's going on in your home. I don't know what's happening in your life. I don't know what kind of boss you have. But I can pretty much assure you it's not that bad as this. Yet, Jesus has said it. I want your will to be done, not mine. What a powerful prayer. God, I want what you want, not what I want. I'll wrap it up and my last thought is this. Will this honor God? You have to ask yourself in your relationships, in your interactions, will this honor God? What I'm going to do, will it honor God? I know you know the verse. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. Do, do the things we talked about in the life that you want on the other side of that. He'll give you what you want. The, the dreams you have come from seeking God first. And I guess the simple question is, is will this honor God? And that's just, I can't answer that for you. I don't know what, what that looks like to you right now. Will this honor God? You know, that's something we say in our home to our kids often. They're going to buy an outfit. Well, there's no rules. See, when I went to Bible college, there was rules. They had all these rules. And men, and, you know, and you, we're going to go back to the late 80s, mid 80s. And my friend Emerson will appreciate this. At ORU, where Dino went, you know, you had to wear skirts and they measured them uh, this much up, and they had rulers out to measure them on your knee. And I was just thinking as a young guy, where's that verse in the Bible? I wish that was a verse in the Bible that said, don't go an inch above your knee, below your knee, that kind of a thing. And what they were trying to do was regulate what honored God. And, and so we would just tell our kids, we're not, we don't have rules like that. The question you have to answer is, will it honor God? Does that honor God? You see? A couple, three, four months ago, I got a cable company that called me. We switched in and they called me and emailed me and said, listen, we want you back and we want to, we're going to give you all these channels for free if you'll come back for a whole year. And I said, well, I don't want all those channels. They go, well, they're free. And I said, well, some of those channels I don't want in my house. They go, well, they're free. He said, why, why don't you? 
I said, you really don't want to know. She said, yeah, I do want to know. I said, you don't want to know. I said, I'm a pastor. You want me to preach a message to you? Because I'm getting ready to. She says, yeah. I said, because I don't think that stuff in my home will, will honor God. Now, I know you say, well, no big deal. We don't like the process, but we want the end result. And here's my plea to you. Ask yourself, in all things relationship, will this honor God? And let that be your prayer. Father, I thank you for every person here today. Lord, we've been, we've been challenged by James. And Lord, I know this is a hard one for us today. So much disappointment, disillusionment of what could be has happened. Could I have a friendship? Like, could our friendship ever return to what it was? Could my marriage, could my home, could my family? And we, Lord, I'm reminded of the verse in Hebrews where it said, Jesus was tempted on all points like as we are. He gets it. He knows what it's like to be hurt, to be betrayed, to be rejected, to be spoken bad about when you didn't do anything wrong. And so Lord, at that moment, you just told us to go right to the throne room of grace to find some help. And so Lord, I'm praying for the person here that's disillusioned. I'm praying for the person that's hurt here today. Lord, I'm praying for the one that's been so deeply wounded by people of no fault of their own. And Lord, I don't know where the future of that relationship would be. That's between you and them. But Lord, I know the now what you can do. They could love again. They could believe again. And it's what Dylan said at the very beginning. In our brokenness, one touch from God could change us. And so Lord, what I felt led to pray was that would be lifted off of them today. The guilt, the shame, the embarrassment, and mainly the disillusionment. And I pray, Lord, that you would do something that I could never do. That you would heal people today. 